page 44 of the book <laughs> is where I decided I wanted to turn in my membership card for humanity. <laughs> Uh, is that uh, uh, an average, or are most people go earlier, and I'm just pretty bitter and cynical and held on a long time? You know, it's it was a real question. That was one of the hardest things with this book, is that at some point, you have to lay out the whole grim picture of what we've done to this natural world that used to exist. And uh, I guess I decided to you know get people warmed up a little bit, and then and then sort of drop drop the uh, the humanity bomb. But, you know, the goal, the hope anyway, is that the book then turns around and uh, because there are two things that we can do with this knowledge, right? We can look back at the, at the richness and abundance of, the, of nature in the past and we can lament it and we can feel guilty about ourselves as human beings or uh, we can use it as an inspiration for the kind of natural world we might make in the future. And that's really... You know, where I, I hope the book steers people. You say we're living in a 10% world, and that's not GST, that's what? The 10% world is really, I mean, one of the great pleasures of doing this book was that I got to spend a lot of time reading explorers' journals and old sea captains' diaries, and along with a lot of scientist studies about how many whales there used to be, how many beavers, how many birds, and this number just keeps coming up. I mean, uh, we have typically, in a, in a very, in a very uh, thumbnail, rough sketch kind of way, we have dropped the abundance of the natural species and landscapes by about 90 percent. You know, we've reduced the Great Plains of North America by 90 percent or more. We've reduced the largest fish in the sea by 90% or more. We've reduced the, the number of fish that are uh, spawning up into our freshwater rivers by about 90%. The number just kept coming and coming. And also I realized that the impression of the world that I was getting from these explorers, journals and diaries and so on, it felt like a completely different planet, you know, that, that, that you visit when you read through these old these old uh, descriptions of it and looking around myself I felt like yeah that's that number feels right to me it feels like we're now living in a 10% world. You talked about the sort of amnesia that we have sort of collectively and and as a species. Yeah there's this this concept or phenomenon that I bumped into in the research called shifting baseline syndrome and and it's it affects all of us, and it's it's as simple as uh, we get our idea of what nature should look like from our childhood. When we're kids, we look around ourselves and we say, "This is nature," and then over our life over our lifetimes, we'll measure changes or declines to the natural world against that baseline. But then the next generation comes along and does the same thing, and then the next generation comes along and does the same thing. So we're constantly resetting our standard for what the normal state of nature is. And what we lose in that is uh, we lose track of the declines that happen over the long term, over decades and certainly over centuries or even millennia. And it's, again, it's one of these things where in a way it's a very dark thing to realize that we, that we, you know, that we really forget what nature <laughs> used to look like. Um, but on the other hand, I found it I found it kind of optimistic because I think our tendency is to say, oh, we destroyed the world through raw rapaciousness and greed. But then it turns out that we also allowed a lot of this degradation to happen simply because we didn't remember what nature used to be. And so through the power of remembering, through actively trying to remember uh, what nature used to be like, we can, we can reverse that pattern. We can start to look forward and say, we want to build uh, a future for nature that is reminiscent of, of what we know it can be now. What is the difference between um, what we've tried to do in the past by bringing things back or bringing things in and this concept of rewilding, which I've never heard of before, but since you introduced me to the word locavore and it's become <laughs> trendy, I'm getting ready to use it. <laughs> Excellent. It, uh, the difference is, is subtle in some ways, I guess. I mean, I think as you said, in the past, what we've tended to do is just try to 
lay a patch on a patch on a patch on a patch. You know, we make some kind of mistake and we think in a very linear way, oh, uh, we've got too many rabbits. What eats rabbits? Foxes. You know, we'll put some foxes there and they'll eat the rabbits. But then it turns out the foxes eat uh, 20 different endangered species at the same time that they're eating rabbits or they don't eat the rabbits at all. So it's that, that kind of linear direct management thinking that has been a, that has been a real problem. Um, rewilding, because it relies on the past, uh, involves fewer of, of those sorts of errors. I mean, we're, n we're not then saying, let's take species from, uh, from China and introduce them to Australia in order to try to solve a problem, an ecological problem that's emerging there. We're looking more at uh, trying to rebuild some of the natural structures of the past. Even though we can't rebuild them perfectly, we do still use the past as a guide and uh, as a way to you know, tell us whether we're moving in the right direction or not. Uh, because most places, even though they are dynamic and they, and they do change, they, you know, in a human time scale, they are fairly stable. And we, you know, we can sort of rebuild, uh, rebuild aspects of what was there in the past and hope to come, you know, hope to find something that's more whole and, and can start to, uh, uh, sustain itself, you know, without us always having to feel like we're, we're the managers of it. The book is The Once and Future World, Nature as It Was, As It Is, and As It Could Be. I've been speaking with the author J.B. McKinnon, you probably know him best from The 100 Mile Diet, and The Once and Future World, published by Random House Canada.